us will move to advanced uh, ones. So uh, I would like to thank also all the audience who are with us uh, this evening. Uh, the uh, webinar will, uh, will focus uh, on four topics. So let us start. The first presenter will be Dr. Saad uh, Al-Amr. She's a pediatric cardiologist. She's an interventional pediatric cardiologist and uh, her main interest in the interventional field, but also has an interest in fetal uh, cardiology as well. Saad will be talking to us about the indications for fetal uh, echo. Welcome, Saad. Uh, thank you, Dr. Halima, for the introduction. Um, shall I share my screens? Yes, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for, uh, for the invitation uh, to join you uh, tonight in this uh, webinar. Uh, hope that everyone is uh, safe uh, and well uh, during this uh, pandemic. Uh, as uh, Dr. Halim introduced me, I, from, I am from Bahrain, uh, working at uh, MKCC Center in Bahrain, uh, doing pediatric cardiac intervention, and uh, I have uh, an interest in fetal echo as well. So my talk this night would be about the indication of uh, fetal uh, echo. And just to start uh, with, um, congenital heart disease is, is one of the most uh, common congenital anomalies. And actually half of the infant uh, death are due to the congenital heart disease. Uh, the prevalence uh, in the States is, um, is, is about uh, 14s in per, per thousands of live births. But the recent study of the overall uh, prevalence of congenital heart uh, disease account of 8.1% per thousands of life uh, birth. And the prevalence of the critical congenital heart disease is account between 3 to 4.4 4 per thousands of life birth. This is for the congenital heart defect that requiring intervention in the first uh, uh, year of life. Uh, so also actually the frequency of congenital heart disease is uh, six times higher than chromosomal defects and four times higher than a neural tube uh, defect. And uh, early detection of congenital heart disease will improve the uh, uh, patient prognosis. Uh, prenatal diagnosis is essential for early diagnosis. And uh, actually, uh, routine uh, use of fetal echocardiography for high-risk pregnancies was started in 1980s. But the concept of secretion at the World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology started in 1985. And the fetal echocardiography is now widely used in pediatric cardiology and perinatology, and even in fetal uh, cardiac intervention. So why to do cardiac scan? Actually, mostly for most frequent missed anomalies, uh, for most common anomaly that detect at, uh, after birth or at birth. And actually it's a marker for other abnormalities like uh, chromosomal, genetic, extra cardiac uh, anomalies as well. And also it contribute to the infant morbidity, mortality will be uh, profoundly affected of the life longevities after birth. So why to do cardiac scan? Actually, prenatal diagnosis improved the postnatal outcome, especially in those uh, conditions with the congenital heart disease, like transmission of the great arteries or coaptation of the aorta, where they need a special uh, um, uh, need or uh, need special treatment uh, immediately after birth. Or actually, it's very important to know for the parents, as they would be more prepared, especially in those like suspected cases, in case of uh, TABVD, total anomalous supermembranous drainage, or VSD. So it's very important to do a fetal scan or I mean an, an echocardiography in the neonatal period or after delivery. Uh, so how successful is cardiac evaluation during routine scanning? Actually, there's a huge variation in different center between cities and between units uh, and, and reported mostly. So Paul et al. in 1999 in UK, they reported 23 of major congenital heart disease because of geographical variation. So the limitation was during, uh, due to uh, geographical variation. Uh, Tegender et al. in 2006, they reported 57% of uh, uh, congenital heart disease. This was due to uh, sonographer experience uh, variability. And also uh, Garni et al. in 2005, 
there was uh, a limitation of, of uh, detection of congenital heart disease. It was only 40% detected, uh, detected, and that was uh, related to the type of congenital heart disease, like hypoblast was detected in 57%, and patients with transposition of the great arteries were detected 27%. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a huge variation in the center uh, due to the cities and units experience and uh, uh, geography uh, variation. So what is the aim of uh, fetal, uh, fetal echo? To recognize normal as normal, to recognize the abnormal as abnormal, to describe the finding and arrive at the diagnosis, to confirm the presence or absence of cardiac disease. So if it's abnormal, it will, we can characterize those abnormalities. We can uh, develop accurate differential diagnosis and most probable diagnosis to identify the PTCs who required immediate uh, medical or surgical attention after birth, especially as I mentioned earlier, those patients who, who need intervention immediately after birth, whether medical or uh, uh, like, you know, catheterization or even surgical uh, management. So when to do fetal cardiography, uh, usually we have to do it between 18 to 22 uh, weeks of gestation, as I mean, um, my colleagues will mention it more or talk about it uh, further later on. This is a due of the shadowing of the effect of the fetal reps or the fetal body mass to amni amniotic fluid will increase. So the acquisition of the image will be uh, more difficult. So basically it's much better to do it between 18 to 22 weeks of uh, gestation. But sometimes we need to do it uh, earlier because of like patients have uh, an increase of nacal translucency and especially in those uh, patients with uh, Down syndrome, like they would have increased uh, nacal translucency. So we, we uh, need to do that fetal echo between uh, 11 to 14 weeks uh, of, of gestation. But at that time, usually the cardiac details will not be uh, elicit well, but we have other, uh, other, uh, other things that we can take it in, in mind, like if there is a presence of uh, pulsatile ductus venosus or tricuspid with uh, valve regurgitation, they would be a strong marker for uh, cardiac and uh, chromosomal anomalies. Uh, so what is the indication for convent, uh, converting a routine scan into fetal echocardiography? Actually, when there is inability to, visual, uh, to see or visualize a normal four chamber view or out of flow tract view, or if there is a recognized risk factor for congenital uh, cardiac disease for both fetal or maternal, if there is any chamber asymmetry, if there is an altered cardiac axis, altered position of the fetal heart, enlarged fetal heart, or arrhythmia, whether bradyarrhythmia or tachyarrhythmia. So now I'll be talking about the bulk of or what I was asked to talk about today, which is the indication of fetal echocardiography. Actually, we subdivided them into three categories, whether they are maternal, familial, or fetal. So when we talk about maternal indication of fetal echocardiography, we have to think about metabolic disorders like mothers with diabetes mellitus, whether uh, gestational diabetes or they have uh, type 1 diabetes, or those mothers with fetal ketonuria. Exposure to teratogens like isotretin or lithium, ethanol, or any anti-epileptic medication like uh, uh, valproate or phenytoin. Exposure to prostaglandin synthase inhibitors like ibuprofen, um, aspirin, or endomethacin. Uh, maternal uh, infections like, you know, uh, patient infected with rubella, barbovirus uh, B19 or Coxsackie virus, this all infection in the first trimester, or sometimes autoimmune diseases like SLE or Chagrin disease in the mother. So these are basically maternal indication for fetal echocardiography. So when we talk about the familial indication, uh, we'll be talking about inherited disorders like elvis Werner krebel syndrome, Morphan, Nonan syndrome, William, or Dijarge syndrome. Uh, it's also important if the mother is going for in vitro fertilization or the pregnancy is carried on by IVF. So it's also important to do a, a fetal echocardiography in the appropriate time. Family history of congenital heart disease, whether the mother itself, she herself have a history of congenital heart disease or if there is any previous sibling of uh, congenital heart disease. So these are the indication to do fetal echo. We come to the fetal indication. If there is increased first tri trimester nacal trans uh, translucency, as I mentioned earlier, if there is abnormal ductus venosus waveform, if there is abnormal fetal cardiac scanning, 
abnormal fetal situs, if there is major extra cardiac uh, abnormalities and any other symptoms, if there is abnormal fetal karyotype, which is indicated with the chromosomal uh, studies, uh, fetal arrhythmias, whether persistent bradyarrhythmias or uh, tachyarrhythmias, if the baby presented with hydrofetalis, okay, or if there is multiple gestation, gestation with suspicion of a twin to twin transfusion syndrome. So uh, in view of the literature, um, actually, uh, uh, I, I just wanted through a few articles, uh, just here to see the relationship of gestational diabetes with the congenital heart uh, disease. Actually, this is done by Lindsay uh, Hunter. It's, it's a little bit old, the study, but actually in this study, they showed that like, you know, uh, the prevalence or the incidence of uh, congenital heart disease in patients and, and mothers with gestational diabetes. Actually, uh, they have studied uh, 1,400 women uh, with type 1 diabetes mellitus. Uh, they referred them to fetal echocardiography, and it was found that 3% of those women have congenital heart disease. Also, those women with gestational diabetes, uh, similarly, they have found that around 2.76% uh, when they did the fetal echo that they detected the congenital heart disease. So they concluded that uh, patients with gestational diabetes mellitus they are at high risk of congenital heart disease um, in their babies because due to uh, hyperglycemia, insulin, uh, insulin resistance, or elevated BMI in these mothers, and add undiagnosed pregestational diabetes. So from this, it was there is an indication to do uh, congenital uh, to do fetal echocardiography for those moms with uh, gestational diabetes because the risk is is high. It's, it could come up uh, to five percent. I'll come. Uh, I'll talk about it more in other uh, studies. So uh, another thing also here, uh, so uh, this in this uh, study, a prenatal diagnosis and a pregnancy and outcome of uh, 1,492 FTCs with congenital heart disease. Actually here they have studied of, uh, they have studied about the uh, 67,843. And uh, among those pregnant women, they found that uh, 1,492 of, the, of these VTCs uh, they have, uh, congenital heart uh, disease, and uh, the prenatal genetic testing found revealed 20% of those 1,492 they have a chromosomal abnormalities. So the uh, the accuracy of a prenatal diagnosis of the uh, of uh, to diagnose fetal congenital heart disease with simple congenital heart disease was 90.5 uh, to 91, and it's about 95% with combis congenital heart disease. So uh, actually, perinatal ultrasound is most effective method in diagnosis uh, fetuses with congenital heart disease. So another study here, just uh, to show the evaluation of uh, fetal echocardiography as a routine antenatal screening uh, tool to detect congenital heart disease. And this study, uh, actually, they have uh, taken 1,280 uh, pregnant women. And among those women, uh, 118 were characterized to have high risk. And, uh, and 1,162 were found to have of a low risk. And uh, among those patients, uh, they have found that 26 of the cases, they have congenital heart disease. And two of them were of those of a high uh, risk and, uh, and the other 24 of a low risk pregnancy. So the difference in the incidence was not much significant. So they conclude in this study that there is no difference in, of congenital heart disease between a pregnancy associated with high risk compared of the low risk. So they advocate actually in this study to do fetal echocardiography as a routine antenatal screening for all pregnant women. This is, I mean, their, their, their view. But when we see <coughs> when to refer, uh, when not to refer to echocardiography. So sometimes we see a single echogenic uh, intracardiac foci without any associated uh, extracardiac anomalies. I mean, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, any force uh, patient to do fetal echocardiography. There is consanguineous uh, marriage and there, there is no other history of congenital heart disease in both parents or an other sibling. Or sometimes if there is normal heart and routine antenatal screening. So these are all, uh, I mean, indication not, one, not to do fetal echocardiography. So uh, in this actually uh, also study or in this table showed the low yield of fetal echocardiography uh, when there is no suspicion of congenital heart disease. As you see here, uh, if it's, I mean, indication there's a suspected congenital heart disease at obstetric, uh, obstetrician uh, screening, it found that it has 29.7, so almost 30%. If there is a suspicion, 
by obstructive, obstructive screening that those patients will have moderate to severe congenital heart disease. So this is very high yield here. But compare and, and to see here also gestational or pre-gestational uh, diabetes, we can see that they are at 5% risk of having moderate to severe congenital heart disease. But when you see here ecogenic foci, 0% of them to have moderate or severe congenital heart disease. And there will be 2% uh, to have mild or even no significant congenital heart disease. So this table does show us the, the, the yield of echocardiography among those patients with gestational diabetes or if, there, if there's a, a obstetric, uh, obstetric uh, screening you know, uh, uh, risk or feeling of suspicion of congenital heart uh, disease. So another one here, uh, why not to refer? Why not to refer all the patients with congenital heart disease? So actually, this, this is a referral for fetal echocardiography because it's associated with high or increased uh, risk of or increased maternal anxiety. Actually, they concluded in this study that the pregnant women who present for fetal echocardiography, they have higher anxiety level compared to those women who are not presenting with fetal echocardiography. So clinical awareness and sensitivity is recommended and further investigation of modifiers of anxiety in this high risk group should be explored. Uh, so there are clear indication to do uh, fetal echocardiography. Similarly, clear indication to do uh, want to do uh, echo, uh, fetal echocardiography for for fetal uh, causes and familial causes. So we come to a conclusion, like you know, perinatal diagnosis allow the parent to understand the nature of the cardiac lesion and discuss the available treatment option and prognosis uh, to come to informed decision. It helped to predict the course of management, the need of the delivery or transfer to another center or high specialized center, which need, uh, if they need uh, urgent intervention immediately after birth. Also, it helped the parents, uh, uh, it gave the parents, sorry, a comprehensive uh, information about the quality of life after the uh, baby delivery. And also perinatal diagnosis will help to plan the fetal cardiac intervention, which will be significantly uh, alter the natural history and improve the outcome of the baby. Uh, it helps indirect impact on postnatal outcome. It will reduce the mortality and morbidity and preoperative brain injury, which you observe in some certain diseases like in TGA or uh, an out of flow tract obstructions or patients with the coarctation of the aorta. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Suad. Very nice and concise uh, summary for the fetal indications. Uh, we will leave the questions and comments at the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, is it uh, clear to you? Yes, doctor, it's clear. Okay, so uh, I'll be the second uh, presenter. I'll be presenting about the uh, basics of uh, fetal echo and uh, standard images. So I'll be talking briefly about uh, fetal circulation and then we'll move to screening. Uh, and determining the right and left uh, side of the fetus, the cardiac position and axis. Then we'll move to basic views uh, with the sweep and finally the checklist. Uh, as we all know that uh, congenital heart disease is the most common congenital anomaly found in the human. And the detailed fetal exam is really needed to make a complete and accurate uh, diagnosis. Usually we do scanning in the second trimester, starting from uh, 18 to 22 weeks. At uh, that time, uh, they refer us uh, when they want to rule out the congenital uh, anomalies. So a complete and uh, detailed diagnosis is achieved by using what's called segmental uh, approach. Uh, this means that uh, you are uh, defining the anatomy segment by segment. Uh, trying to define the connections within the heart, finding the uh, respective inlet and outlet uh, component. So standard screening views are really useful to confirm uh, the normal heart uh, structure. 
Regarding fetal circulation, we all know that the uh, placenta is the main blood supply and oxygenation for the fetus. So the oxygenated blood will come from the placenta through the umbilical vein, then it will go through the ductus venosus to the right side of the fetal heart, and through the foramen ovale, it will cross, bulk of it will cross to the left side, so left atrium, left ventricle, and ascending aorta to the rest of the body. Part of this blood will go also through the tricuspid valve into right ventricle, then ductus arteriosus to the rest, to the descending aorta and rest of the body. The deoxygenated blood will be coming back through the umbilical artery to the placenta again for oxygenation. When we talk about the uh, fetal circulation, we need to remember three structures, the ductus venosus, the foramen ovale, and the ductus arteriosus. So for the ductus venosus, it is basically a venous connection between the umbilical vein and the uh, IVC. We can obtain the view for the ductus venosus either when the fetus in sagittal plane, for example, in this view, or when uh, in, feet, in the cross section, just below the diaphragm when you see the stomach. The right heart circulation in the fetus is connected to the systemic circulation by the foramen ovale and the ductus arteriosus. And we need to know that the circulatory flow pattern in the fetus is different from the neonate. In the fetus, it is right to left shunt direction. If it is left to right, then we need to rule out left side obstruction. Moving to determining the right and left side of the fetus. In this diagram, this is what's called the Cordes method. For us as fetal cardiologists to define the right and left, we use this method. For our colleagues in the fetal maternal, they use different way. And for them, it's important to know where is the marker on the probe. For us, it doesn't matter. So the important thing, when you scan the fetus, to put him, to put the fetus in sagittal plane, either this view or this view. Here, the spine will be down, and here, the spine will be up. The important thing is that the head of the fetus should be on the right side of the screen. So from this view, if, it, if the head, for example, on this view, then you need to rotate your probe all the way to put the head in this position. If, if you start and you see the head in this position, then just you need uh, to rotate your probe uh, 90 uh, degrees to make it in cross uh, section. This is called Cordes method. After you rotate your probe in clockwise rotation 90 degree, you will get one of these four uh, views. Either it will be this one, this one, or this one, or this one. So in the middle, in all four is the spine. So spine, as we know, the posterior structure. So this is posterior, anterior. And you need to remember that here precedes the right. So this will be the left. It will be more clear in this view. So here, this is the head of the baby. This is the sagittal uh, plane. Now we'll do clockwise. Uh, rotation to get a cross section. Good. So this view is similar somehow to this view. So this is the spine, then this is posterior, this is anterior. And they told you that what precedes will be the right. So all this will be the right side of the fetus, and this will be the left side of the fetus, and this is the stomach. So when we see this view, we say it is situs solitus. And we need to see also the aorta and IVC. Then we move to determining the fetal cardiac position and axis. As we all know that normally the fetal heart 
uh, will be in the uh, normal in the uh, it will be in the left side of the chest and the apex will be to the uh, to the uh, left so we call it levocardia the heart occupies 35% of the cardiothoracic ratio if the apex is in the middle then we call it mesocardia if it is to the right then it is uh, dextrocardia so in this diagram this is the left this is the right rv lv so here the apex is pointing to the right so it is uh, dextrocardia dextrocardia can be seen in a normal heart but also can be associated with the situs inversus or ambiguous or other abnormalities. This diagram showing what's called dextroposition. So still here the apex to the left, but the heart itself is pushed to the right when there is left side problem. For example, left side diaphragmatic hernia or left lung uh, mass, left pleural effusion or uh, scimitar syndrome where the right lung is hypoplastic. So the heart is uh, pushed uh, to or pulled to the right side. Mesocardia, when the heart will be in the middle, for example, in cases of uh, transposition of great arteries, some cases of uh, DRV, and in case of laryngeal atresia, as in this diagram, where both lungs are hyperinflated and the heart is squeezed uh, in between. Now we move to determining the fetal uh, cardiac axis. So the normal fetal cardiac axis is about 45 degree plus minus 20. And how to obtain or how to do it? For example, in this diagram and uh, in this view, so here this is the spine, then this is posterior and this is anterior. We need to draw a line from the spine all the way to the anterior part of the chest and uh, then another line going through the interventricular septum. Same thing here. So line from spine all the way anterior, another line through the uh, septum. And the angle in between is the cardiac axis. This is normal. If it is too much to the left side, then we call it left axis deviation and it is abnormal. If it is to the right side more, then it is right axis deviation. And again, it is abnormal. I'll show you some conditions with abnormal cardiac axis. So uh, in left axis deviation, conditions like tetralogy of fallow, coarctation, Epstein, right axis deviation, the uh, DRV, and uh, common atrium. I can see someone is raising the hand. Uh, um, so we'll leave the comments till the end, but just I want to make sure, do you still hear me well, uh, Zakia? Yes, doctor, it's clear. Okay. So uh, the questions and comments will be at the end of the presentation. Uh, just uh, take note of that, uh, that please. Now, uh, example of left axis uh, deviation. This is a case of uh, truncus arteriosus. So this is a normal heart. Uh, while in the truncus arteriosus, there is left axis uh, deviation. So this is the uh, diagram. It is similar to it. It's more deviated to the left. Then we call it uh, left axis deviation. Uh, transposition of great arteries, uh, as you can see, so from spine to the anterior chest, and then another line through the septum. So this is mesocardia. Uh, in DRV, although uh, they mentioned it's right axis deviation, but really for me, sometimes I found it <laughs> left axis deviation and sometimes uh, mesocardic. In tetralogy of follow, so this is normal, and this is tetralogy of follow. Uh, uh, look at the diagram here. So the, uh, the axis is shifted again to the uh, left side, so we call it left axis deviation. We move now to the basic views. We have, we have uh, six views uh, when we do fetal scanning. The upper abdomen, the four chamber view, the three vessel view, the outflow tract, the uh, left ventricle outflow tract, the right ventricle outflow tract, and the ductal arch and the aortic arch.
So here again, the fetus in sagittal plane, then clockwise rotation. Here we started to see the arch view. Uh, one point I, I want to mention, yeah, I'm emphasizing on, I'm emphasizing on uh, uh, doing the chord method to tell what is the right and the left. And that is important in the beginning. After that, it doesn't matter. And you don't need to uh, concentrate where is the marker on the probe. This is very important in doing fetal uh, echo. It's not the same technique as in uh, fetal maternal. So now starting to see the uh, crossing pattern of both outflow tracts, the LVOT uh, and the RVOT. Uh, same thing, this is cross section. Already I know the right side, the left side, stomach on the left. This is the descending aorta, the fourth chamber view. It's very important to optimize your image and Dr. Myrna in her part will be talking about how to optimize the image while scanning fetal echo. So for chamber view, outflow tracts, crossing nature of great arteries, three vessel views. The first view after you get the cross section, it will be at the level of the upper abdomen. It's very important to make a complete cross section with one rib. If you have multiple ribs, then uh, so many things will come uh, there, uh, drop out and, or your diagnosis might not be correct. So try your best when you rotate to obtain a complete rib. When you get this cross section, you will determine you, the right side of the fetus, the left side, stomach will be on the left, liver on the right. The uh, structure immediately close to the uh, spine will be the aorta, so posterior to the left, IVC anterior to the right. When you see this view, this is called situs solitus, which is normal. If it is other than this, then it is not situs solitus. If, for example, the position of the IBC and aorta is reversed, we call it situs inversus. And also there is what's called heterotaxy or isomerism. And this is also abnormal, but uh, I'll not talk about it in my uh, presentation. Uh, next view is the four chamber view. So see how nicely here, uh, one complete uh, rib, where you can comment on the four chamber uh, view. It's very important to know that before 30, 32 weeks of gestation, the, uh, four the uh, right ventricle and left ventricle are symmetrical, almost similar size. After 30, 32 weeks, the right ventricle will be more dominant, so the right ventricle hypertrophy. So when we do the four chamber view, what are the things we need to look at? Here already I know where is the right, where is the left. So I know that the right ventricle on the right. Why it is important to determine the right side of the baby and the left side? Because this will tell you later on whether the right ventricle really is located by its features located on the right side or on the left, because there are conditions where the right ventricle is not on the right side uh, of the fetus. So right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. The ventricle follows the valve. So, uh, sorry, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. The ventricle follows the valve. So. How can I determine if I am really not sure? How can I determine the uh, tricuspid and the uh, mitral? The uh, tricuspid is more epically uh, uh, located while the mitral is up. The tricuspid valve has septal attachment to the septum. So we call it septophilic, while the mitral is away septophobic. The right ventricle is heavily trabeculated and occupied by the moderator band, while the uh, left ventricle is more of conical smooth uh, endocardium. And for the uh, right ventricle, it has three papillary muscles, 
and there is direct insertion of the cody tendon into the ventricular wall, while the left ventricle has two uh, papillary muscles and no direct uh, cordy tendon insertion into uh, the wall. In left ventricle, you will see the papillary muscles while in the uh, two of them, while in uh, right ventricle, there are three papillary muscles. Now, regarding the nature for the uh, atria, for the left atrium, you need to see at least the entrance of two pulmonary veins by 2D and uh, by color. It's very important when you do the four chamber view, when you visualize the aorta, there should be, for example, here is the LA and this is the descending aorta. There should be no wide gap between the posterior wall of the LA and the descending aorta. If there is a wide gap, then you need to rule out uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage uh, when there is a confluence between the uh, descending aorta and the left uh, atrium. Uh, always do two, 2D and then move to uh, color. Color will help you to see if there is any regurgitation. It will help you uh, to look at the interventricular septum if there is any shunt. Uh, regarding the interventricular uh, septum, the uh, two third of it is muscular and one third is uh, membranous. Uh, also in four chamber view, it will give you uh, uh, a hint about the squeezing or contraction of the heart muscle. So again, 2D and uh, color, there is no uh, regurgitation. And in this view, I can see one pulmonary vein entering into the left atrium. Uh, regarding the septum, I told you again, 2D and color. Here you can see there, across the septum, there is a shunt, so there is a small mid muscular uh, VSD. You need to know that in the fetus, the RV and LV pressure will be uh, equal. So if you find it bi directional, not to worry. But if it is purely left uh, to right, then you need to know that uh, there is left side obstruction. From uh, yeah, so uh, here, after the four chamber view, if I go all the way anteriorly, then I will see the three vessel view. If I move this way or this way, then I will start to open the outflow tracts. So from four chamber view, as I said, if we move this way, we'll open the LVOT. If we move this way, we'll open the RVOT. And it's very important to see the crossing nature of the great arteries to rule out uh, transposition of uh, great arteries. Um, as we all know, the aorta is arising from the uh, left ventricle and there is fibrous continuity between the uh, aorta and mitral uh, leaflet. The RVOT here giving rise to uh, pulmonary. So this is short axis uh, view. This is the aortic cross section surrounded by the right ventricle, and these are the pulmonary artery view. This view in particular is very important in uh, tetralogy of color. For example, in this uh, picture. So this is the outlet uh, septum in the middle, surrounded by the pulmonary artery. So normally this should be closed. There should be no VSD, but in this patient here is the VSD, and this is the pulmonary valve. Here there is anterior deviation of the outlet septum. This is a case of tetralogy of color. Same thing, 2D and uh, color. Here is the pulmonary valve, and these are the two confluent uh, pulmonary arteries. Uh, now we move to the three vessel view. Three vessel view obtain it from four chamber view by anterior angulation. Uh, we call it three vessel trachea view. So you will see the pulmonary in this arrangement, three vessels, pulmonary, aorta, and SVC. The pulmonary will continue as ductal arch, aorta will continue as uh, transverse arch, and the SVC, and they form what's called V sign. These are very important, so the, the size will be almost equal, same color flow pattern, and in this arrangement. If the size is 
smaller or there is reversal flow in one of them, this, then this indicates that it is abnormal. What is abnormal in this uh, three vessel view? So here, instead of having three vessels, there are four vessels. So what we call it bilateral SPC. So we have pulmonary, aorta, and SPC. One, two, three, and four. Then we move to aortic arch. How to get this view? So from three vessel views, from three vessel view, we try to connect each vessel with the descending aorta and then clockwise, uh, 90 uh, clockwise 90 degree rotation to make it uh, elongated. The uh, aortic arch feature will be that it starts from the middle part of the chest, it has a short course giving rise to head and neck vessels, and it has the appearance of what's called candy cane appearance. So, this is 2D and color again. So here starts from the middle part of the chest, head and neck vessels, and you can see a laminar flow uh, across it. In opposite to a uh, ductal arch, it starts from the anterior part of the chest. It has a long course. It doesn't give rise to head and neck vessels, and it has what's called the hockey stick appearance. Again, 2D and uh, color. It's very important to note that when you do the arch view, you will not see both arches in one plane. They are at two different uh, planes. By cable view to see the SVC and the uh, IBC. So for our checklist, the position of, we spoke about the position of the heart and that's normally in the left side of the chest, the cardiac axis, the uh, size of the heart, the rhythm should be uh, normal, no bradyno you know, tachy. A normal fetal heart rate above 100 and less than 180. Then contracting and squeezing of the heart muscle. We spoke about the upper abdomen, liver position, stomach on the left, the aorta and the IVC uh, relation. And then symmetry of chamber uh, size. This is when we talk about the four chamber view, the AV valves, the moderator band, the pulmonary veins, the septal integrity, uh, the contractility. And then three vessel view, we talk about the three vessels only to be seen the arrangement and the size, same flow or color flow pattern. The aortic and the ductal arches should have the uh, same uh, color flow. Uh, I didn't talk about the trachea and the bronchi because this is mainly about the uh, basics. We can talk about them later on in the coming uh, webinars and the branch pulmonary uh, arteries. Uh, regarding the outflow tract, uh, the important thing is the crossing nature and uh, patency of the outflow tract. So if you get to the four chamber view, with the uh, crossing nature, then uh, your sensitivity can increase up to 90 to 95%, and you can rule out transposition of the great artery, which is a salvageable condition. Uh, then the outflow tracts also you know, can rule out the, if there is any PSD. Uh, uh, aortic and ductal arches, I uh, want to emphasize about the flow direction should be uh, the same if there is flow reversal, then this indicates that there is an obstruction in one of them. Uh, finally, I'll show you one case. So in this view, what you can tell is that uh, um, the right ventricle is, um, there is hypertrophy in the right ventricle, dilated right side, no VSD. Uh, when you move to the uh, outflow tracks, they are parallel, they are not crossing great, uh, they are not crossing nature. So this is a transposition of great arteries with intact ventricular septum. Then when we go to the three vessel view, this is the normal uh, three vessel view where you see the V sign while here you will see the aorta is anterior and the pulmonary artery is posterior. And then normally, as I said, the aortic arch in one plane, ductal arch in one, another plane, while in fetus in, in the TGA, you can see both of them. So to the TGA, the only in the fourth chamber view because it might be deceiving. The only thing you will see it is uh, just dilated uh, right uh, side. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, so now we move to the uh, third presenter, Dr. Uh, Mirna Atiyah. Dr. Mirna Atiyah is a pediatric cardiologist at uh, Prince Sultan Cardiac uh, Center. She's well known. And um, we did together um, hands-on fetal echo last year, just before the pandemic, alhamdulillah. And uh, she's going uh, to give us two talks, uh, first about the uh, Doppler in fetal echo, and then optimization about uh, uh, images. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Mena, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Halima, if you can stop the sharing, yeah, please. Uh, shukran, thank you very much. And I would like to thank you uh, and all uh, the Oman Society for uh, allowing me to present uh, today. So uh, I will start today with the first lecture. Uh, okay, it's clear. Is it clear the lecture? Yeah, but make it uh, like... Uh, okay. Yeah. So we'll start with the first, uh, which is fetal echo uh, image optimization. Um, sorry, I don't know. Yes. So initially, when we optimize the image, uh, uh, that means that we have to have a better image quality. So we have a better resolution for the image for the more detailed image that we can see all uh, the detail inside the heart. So we start, if we have a poor image from the beginning, uh, definitely we will have more errors and we'll have more wrong diagnosis. And the most appropriate thing that we will have inappropriate uh, family counseling. And this is, I think, very important issue. Um, so how we can optimize the fetal heart? Initially, we have a three most, the key uh, for any image optimization is number one is how to select our echo probe. Number two, how to overcome the uh, challenges that we face it during our scanning when uh, during fetal position or maternal habitus. And we'll just talk about the machine preset optimization. Initially, ecoprobe uh, selection. Um, as uh, all we know, we have different ecoprobe. We have the Kervelina probe, we have uh, the linear probe, we have the footprint. All of this, all of them, they have. Uh, especially uh, all of have had different capability. We are using the curvilinear probe in fetal heart, which is uh, give you more wide footprint for a deep structures. Uh, we, when we select our probe, we have the low frequency probe and we have the high frequency probe. I will not go deep in detail for uh, ecophysics. However, I'll just initially uh, show what is the tip to optimize the fetal echo, because if we go through the physics, it will need more time. So we have two types of the probe. We have the high frequency probe, uh, C49, or uh, we have different from different machine. And we have uh, the low frequency probe, which is uh, the C52. The high frequency probe, it is well known that it show a more bitter detail resolution and usually use in the first or the second trimester. As you can see here um, in these two images, uh, sorry, I don't see. If you can see these, the two images here, uh, the distance, the fetal lay close to the transducer. So it's inappropriate to use the high frequency probe for more detailed resolution. See the distance here is only five. So uh, selection for a low frequency probe is uh, better comparing to this baby where you can see the distance is a 14 centimeters. So you need more better penetration uh, to allow you to assist the fetal heart. So usually the low frequency probe, we are using in the late second or in the third trimester, or in those where the difficult uh, echo windows like maternal habitus or uh, if the mother had a polyhydramnus. Um, other thing that uh, how to choose when we are doing, how to choose the best echo probe, we have to balance so either we are needing a resolution or we need more penetration. So for example, if you see this patient, we're using the C9, the high frequency probe. And if you can see, there is more shadow because of the rib. So we shifted to a low frequency probe to have a for one complete rib, as you can see more C showing the left ventricle. Initially, we are not sure about the LV size. Here, we are confirmed that this patient have 
atrial unbalanced ABST with a large AST primum and large BST and unbalanced with a smallish uh, left ventricle. So you have to balance between either using the resolution or the penetration to have appropriate image. Now we'll go to the next, which is uh, position optimization. We have several challenge when uh, scan the fetal heart, um, either due to the spine uh, shadowing or due to rep shadow, all of this. Has, so as in this, this you can see, this is the uh, cross-section view. We can see the spine here uh, just shadowing the heart. You cannot able to see the heart. So what you do in these situations when you have a spine shadow, uh, so always try to sweep to the other side of the maternal abdomen to uh, transfer uh, the heart to more apical uh, uh, position the, for example, the four, four chamber, just to give you more apical position. So you have to transfer from the other side of the fetal heart of the maternal abdomen, just to overcome these shadows. For example, as you can see, this is the same patient, the previous patient I show it because of the spine mm -hmm. shadow. So I trans, try to sweep with the uh, probe to the, try to the other side, at least to see the heart from, the, from different uh, orientation. Uh, as you can see here, this patient who had uh, uh, AVSD with a large ASD primum and very huge BSD, almost like a single ventricle. Uh, other position challenging with when you can see here, you can see uh, the rib here, uh, just overcome this by just a clock rotation with the probe. This is the probe. We have different uh, way to using the probe. This is what we call the rotating position when you rotate the probe either clockwise or anti-clockwise just to keep to transfer from this image to this image just to be sure that you have a complete rib so you have a complete or accurate uh, cut for the fetal heart so uh, you uh, appropriately um, uh, see the four chamber and see the three vessel and all the other view in more appropriate uh, uh, position other challenges, which is the maternal obesity, and we, I think all of us, we face this problem. We have several um, ways to overcome this, either to scan underneath uh, uh, the excess tissue from this side, or what we call the sim position. The sim position where you are placing the mother, uh, actually, um, in the sim position, you shift her onto examining table on the side and lay almost prone with the upper leg flexed initially and actually at the knee and the lower leg is extended. So what you will, by this position, you will allowing uh, to, to scan from the side of the uterus with the transducer with extra tissue is falling on the left. So you scan on this side, just, just to give you more window and it uh, allow you to overcome uh, the excess tissue. Or sometimes you scan through the umbilicus sometimes, however, through the umbilicus, sometimes it gives you more shadow. So always we try to scan underneath the excess tissue or the same position it might help to overcome the maternal uh, position, uh, maternal challenges uh, or maternal habits. Then we'll go about uh, how to optimize our image by using uh, uh, nobology and the preset in the, in the machine. The most important thing actually when we uh, using uh, uh, to optimize the fetal position is to put in our mind to optimize the temporal resolution. What is the temporal resolution? The temporal resolution is to locate the moving structure, any moving structure at any instant time. So we can able to locate it at any instant time. And um, it considers the key rule, as I mentioned, for fetal 2D image optimization. And to optimize the temporal resolution, you have to have a fast frame rate. In fetal heart, you have to have a frame rate more than 25 to 30 per second to have excellent and better detailed resolution. So how to optimize our fetal uh, frame rate initially by probe, probe selection, as I mentioned initially, using the high uh, frequency probe. Second, the depth, focus, and sector angle, and finally, the zoom magnification. I will talk about each one of these um, uh, in details. As you can see, this is a very nice view, very four chamber with a complete rib. This is the spine posterior. You can show it's an AVSD with a small BSD component. Uh, if you did not have a better, a good image, you're not able to see this a small BSD. And you can see here the frame rate is a 62. So let's talk one by one, which is uh, we talk about the probe selection, then we'll talk about the depth. As all we know, this is, you can see, this is image. Uh, this is the fetal heart, and this is extra depth here. 
that mean the probe will have more, the ultrasound probe will take more time to show the image itself, okay? So if you decrease the depth, if you see this is the C92 probe with a, frequent, with a frame rate of 38. Uh, this is the distant difference, this is 20, and this is 14 by decreasing the depth. And this is the frame rate from 30 or eight increased to 51 just by decreasing the depth and decreasing the depth, improving the temporal resolution and improving the frame rate, improving the detail resolution. Focal zone at the region of the interest, as all we know, this is very important. You can see this is a study. This is a four chamber review where the focal zone are very far away from the four chamber review. Here, just by improving, uh, just putting the focal zone on the region of the interest, actually improve the image and make it more sharp image, very clear uh, image. Uh, so you have to put the focal zone in the uh, region of the inter, uh, of interest. We have two different type of focal zone. We have a single focal zone and we have a multiple focal zone. A single focal zone uh, where you, uh, uh, which is the area where um, all the narrowest, which the, uh, the beam where uh, the narrow at the narrow area. So this is will improve the temporal resolution. It will have a more a high frame rate and better uh, temporal resolution by using the single focal zone. Mm -hmm. However, if you use a multiple focal zone, this is, will improve mainly the lateral resolution, but however, it will slow the frame rate and uh, so uh, subsequently it will worsen the temporal resolution. So we have to use the single uh, focal zone as we uh, show it in the previous case. Sector width, at all we know, this is a case where you can see this is a four chamber with a very wide sector width with a frame rate of 32. Once immediately, once you narrow the sector width, you can see the difference where the frame rate increase to 90 degree. And you can see how is the different, the four chamber review more detail and more clear, more clear image comparing to those with a wide sector uh, depth. So using a narrow sector width is the best to improve our time resolution. Uh, zoom magnification is an important, actually, this is a case where there is without a zoom magnification, and this is a case with a zoom magnification, the fourth chamber is more, the image it looks more bigger, and also the frame rate, you can see the frame rate is 77, and he's a 36, so more uh, detail resolution and more the image is getting more clear. Again, uh, zoom magnification. Uh, we have two types of zoom magnification. We just, by zooming, by making the images bigger, it will not change the frame rate. Once uh, the pre frame rate, it will be continue the same. However, by an, another type of zoom uh, magnification, when you select the zoom area over the specific area of interest, and then you press the zoom button of the zoom, and you can see the frame rate is increased to 77. So using this type of zoom magnification is very helpful to have more better detail resolution. Um, after the temporal resolution, we'll talk about uh, harmonic imaging. Harmonic imaging, again, is allow us for optimization of the fetal image uh, resolution. And the concept of harmonic that, as all we know that, uh, in usual fundamental imaging, you, when you transmit through the probe, for example, 2.5 megahertz, it will be receive, received at the same 2.5. However, harmonic imaging, uh, it, the transmitted beam, for example, 2.5, the received beam, actually, it will be double. So the beam is transmitted out at a low frequency, a retained beam is received at a twice to the transmitted frequency. So it gives you more uh, improving the axial and the lateral resolution, decrease all the artifacts. This is the main um, important point for using a harmonic, decreasing all the artifact and increasing the signal to noise ratio to decrease all these noise ratio and improve the resolution, however, maintaining adequate penetration. This is an example where this is a four chamber view here. You can see without using a harmonic here, you can see the four chamber. However, I'm not, I'm not able to see the interventricular septum uh, and the apical uh, portion of the uh, four chamber. However, by using just turning the harmonic on, you can see how it's showing the interventricular septum very clearly. And you can see the apical uh, 
uh, area uh, very clearly. Although the fourth chamber in epical position, however, sometimes it's difficult to see there is a shadow with all improvement of uh, the image. However, still using some time harmonic is better just for, especially for these difficult cases to be sure that there is no any septal defect, there is no any uh, hypoplasia of any of the ventricles. So using harmonic one is very important, especially for those difficult cases. Using compression, again, uh, compression and gain, you have to balance, especially the compression, as all we know, uh, compression actually high, comp high it call low compression setting, it will cause more high contrast setting. That means low dynamic range, which and that means a fewer shade of gray will be uh, represented in contrast for a low contrast uh, uh, setting, which is a high uh, compression. So actually the fetal heart is a structure with relatively high contract. So actually you need to balance with you between using uh, the compression not too low and not too high to be, uh, be sure about it. So this is a case with a low compression uh, setting. You can see how is the contrast here, a clear uh, edge showing the edge of the wall uh, very clearly comparing with this with a low, uh, uh, with a high compression setting. Still it is appropriate, however, you need to balance between uh, uh, both, either between the law and the compression to be sure about the edges of the uh, wall itself. Color map, uh, color map again, um, as all we know, um, different uh, 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 using different color maps, either using the copper, the copper one or the other uh, color map, is just different visualization of the fetal heart with different uh, color instead of the two. Uh, the, uh, gray color. So it depends on the one who is scanning, which color is more better, give you more better uh, image um, uh, visualizing it. So it is a personal difference. However, sometimes it might help to improve the image itself. Compound imaging. I think compound imaging is very important uh, to be used. Uh, it's uh, have different uh, name um, from a different manufacturer. The compound imaging that mean, this is what we call the compound imaging. The compound images that the ultrasound send a signal at a multiple angle to see the heart from different multiple angles. And it's uh, increase the image resolution, eliminate the artifact itself. Uh, this is very important. And it, as I mentioned, it have different uh, manufacturers. Uh, you can able to uh, manufacture it uh, in your uh, machines itself. So let's give you an example. This is where a case for chamber review with the compound imaging off. And this is, you can see here with just putting on, on the compound imaging, you can see more brighter and more have uh, less a gray uh, appearance. So I think it's very important to improve resolution by using the compound imaging. Spickle tracking imaging, again, uh, important. Uh, again, it have different manufacturers. Uh, from different from and different machines, uh, it eliminate a weak signals and enhance mainly strong signals and brighten. The main thing is to brighten and make more smooth a clear image. Uh, if you can see, this is where speckle tracking off. You can see here's the image, little bit with uh, uh, gray appearance, the same. However, it's getting when you put just putting the speckle tra tra uh, tracking on, you're getting more brightening and more smooth itself. Um, uh, as I mentioned, it's it's not one uh, uh, thing that you have to do it to optimize your image. You have to use different things to optimize. It started from improving temporal resolution, improving using a harmonic, uh, using a compound imaging, and using the speckle tracking Im imaging. All of this and try to overcome all the uh, challenging in the uh, position of the fetus, allowing to help you to have more better detail uh, fetal image. Uh, thank you very much. I will go to the second lecture. Um, any questions or you want us to wait for? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll leave better the questions till the end. So better to go with the, ahead with the uh, last presentation. Okay. Fine. So the second one will go by fetal echodobler assessment. Uh, as all we know that we have a different Doppler modalities, which is available and provide us with the different information about the fetal heart, color Doppler, power Doppler, high definition power Doppler, pulse wave, 
tissue Doppler speaking, we have a difference. However, we'll try to uh, talk about the most important uh, practical one that we are using in daily uh, fetal ecolab. So we'll start by using, uh, starting by the color Doppler. So two things we'll talk about color Doppler. We'll talk about importance of the color Doppler in fetal heart and how to optimize the color uh, Doppler. What is the importance uh, of Dr. color? Verna, just can you stop uh, sharing this presentation and uh, share with us the last uh, talk? Because uh, I can't mm. see, I can't see the, um, the last, oh, can, uh, yeah. You can't see the presentation? Okay, understand. Are you able to see yes, it now? Yes. Okay, yes. Good. Right. So we'll start by color doubler. We'll talk about uh, importance of the color doubler and uh, color doubler optimization. Um, what is the importance of color doubler? Um, as all we know, color doubler is usually access showing uh, the presence of the presence and the direction of the blood flow through different structure in fetal heart. As you can see, this is just a sagittal view. We're showing the left ventricular outflow uh, clearly with no any turbulence. And you can see the direction here. One, it is a blue, that means it is away from the transducer. So it show me the uh, blood flow through the vessel and plus show me the direction. Uh, again, it helped me to assess any turbulence in any uh, of the, any either in the outflow tract or in the AV valve. As you can see, this is a case with a, a crit of a severe aortic stenosis. This is the spine of the fetal heart and this is the left ventricle outflow tract. And you can see there is a turbulence of the blood flow here. Uh, started at the valve, indicated that this is a patient who had uh, aortic stenosis. Um, comparing to the other patient, where you can see uh, showing again at the color doubler at the out left out of low track. This is in a case of severe crit critical aortic stenosis, where hardly you don't see any uh, flow through the out of low track with a very tiny trivial aortic radiate indicating a critical aortic stenosis. So you can see the difference. It is almost the same, almost complete the diagnosis. However, you can see the difference of the color flow uh, just to give you a different management, different diagnosis and different management plan. Color doubler again is important to detect uh, the presence of the retro retrograde flow if there is any retrograde flow at the ductus arteriosus, as Dr. Halim Ashim talked about initially, that in the two visual view where uh, you can see it should be two, the V sign, it should be both uh, coming uh, in the same color. Once we have a retrograde flow at the ductus arteriosus, that means indicate that there is a ductus dependence cardiac lesions, so uh, which is very important in managing a plan of the fetal heart. Again, um, not, that does not mean that all the patient who had, this is a sagittal view of a fetus here, this is a, and this is the spine, this is the arch, and you can see retrograde flow here at the arch. Uh, this patient had completely normal heart. However, uh, he had a severe I, uh, IUGR, and there is a retrograde flow going uh, to supply uh, the vital organ, what we call the frame sparing effect. Again, important of the color Doppler. Uh, it is very important, especially uh, in those with early gestation to assess uh, ventricular arterial relationship. Again, if you have a difficult patient, you are not sure about the ventricle size or uh, fe early fetal. This is a early fetal at 12 weeks. Just to putting a color Doppler, you can see surely that there is a two ventricle, both are, are equal uh, size with a normal inflow. Uh, again, color doubler, it will help us to show if there is any valve anomaly, valve regurgitation. As you can see, the valve regurgitation here, you can see this is the blue flow going uh, backward here. Can pass it. This is the inflow. This is the red flow going toward the transducer. However, a small, tiny uh, regurgitation here, as you can see here, this is the blue flow. This is tricuspid valve regurgitation indicating uh, tricuspid valve um, abnormalities. 
So it's, this is the importance of the color Doppler to assess if there is any valve regurgitation. If you compare this with, this is a normal heart with normal inflow with no any regurgitation or no any stenosis. So oh, how to optimize all these uh, uh, color Doppler? It is very clear if you can see, this is a fetal heart with, where you hardly see that uh, the heart is uh, filling the ventricles comparing to this heart we're very nicely filling both ventricles. So we have to optimize our image of the color Doppler to have appropriate uh, uh, filling of the fetal heart. Uh, important uh, five things that we have to optimize when you are using our color, uh, color Doppler, color box, color gain, wall motion filter, and velocity scale and angle of insulation. So using the color box number one, uh, the same like the 2D, that previous, um, a previous lecture that uh, color box is adjusted by uh, number one position. It should be over the area of the rest. For example, if I want to assess the AV valve, I need to put the color box in the AV valve. Again, um, uh, the color box is adjusted by the width and the length. Why by the width of the length? Because the frame rate actually to have uh, a faster frame rate, uh, it should, uh, it usually is affected by the width of the color box. However, the length and the position is usually affect the color velocity. Uh, that's why to have appropriate uh, color doubler, you have to have the color box should be uh, narrow and it should be short and shallow. So to have appropriate frame rate, as we have desirable to have a high frame rate for this uh, fetal uh, dynamic heart, plus that we have to have a short color box uh, and shallow to have a maximum color velocity. Um, as you can see, this is example. This is a case where uh, using the C51, uh, the frequency here um, is eight, sorry, the frame rate is only eight. As you can see, it's a white color box. Once we decrease the color box to the only the other area of the interest, you can see the frame rate increase from eight to 17. So it's very important to decrease the color box to increase your frame rate. So to optimize, you have to have narrow, short and shallow color box. Number two, color velocity scale or what we call the Nyquist limit. Nyquist limit can be increased or decreased, and the maximum mean velocity displayed actually uh, depend on, as I mentioned before, depend on the depth and the length of the color box, uh, either using a low velocity scale or high velocity scale. Usually we are using a high velocity scale, about 60 centimeter per second for out of flow tract and AV valve, using a low velocity scale, less than 30 centimeter per second for using a vein or these, these, or these. And usually low velocity venous flow require a low scale and low filter setting. Uh, so we have to choose uh, the scale uh, that is not, we should not lose, uh, we should not choose a scale that it is too low, uh, which is, will emphasize the more uh, any unnecessarily flow. For example, like this case where you can see here, there's a low uh, uh, velocity scale, 18. You can see there is suspicion of valve regurgitation. However, comparing to this with a high velocity scale, you can see laminar flow through that tricuspid and the mitral valve. Again, this is a case where we're showing the pulmonary vein, a low velocity scale here, showing nicely the pulmonary vein. However, if you look at the uh, ventricle, you, it is uh, turbulence. You may suspect that the patient have these, these, or valve regurgitation. So we are mainly looking for the pulmonary vein like this case, I decreased the scale to 28, just to showing nicely the pulmonary vein filling uh, and showing nicely. Again, here with a high scale of 60, just to show laminar flow, you can see a blue flow through the valve, through the tricuspid and the mitral valve and with no any turbulence or stenosis. So we have to determine the range, the uh, usually velocity scale determine the range of the mean velocity in the region of the interest. And you have to choose uh, which either low or high scale will depend on the structure that you are looking for. Number three, uh, we have uh, what we call uh, using a color Doppler in case of, uh, for uh, improving the angle of insulation. Angle of insulation, as all we know, is defined as the angle of the ultrasound beam 
relative to the tissue or the organ of the interest. So the strongest echo are produced when an angle of the incidence approach to the angle of the reflection. So if the if the, it is they are in the same angle, they are parallel of the in the toward the tissue, you will have the strong echo. However, if the angle either uh, uh, more than 90 or less than 90, you will have a little bit weak echo. So uh, that means that I have to have to put the heart parallel to the direction of the blood flow when I scan. When uh, then I put the color doppler, it will be optimal and showing this, as you can see, the outer flow track is a very great, very showing filling to the outer flow track because the course of the blood flow parallel to the angle of oscillation. This is again for chamber review. This is the four chamber review and these orientation, you can see in these orientation, the four chamber in the four chamber are an apical uh, uh, position or a uh, basal view. You, this is where you can see the course of the blood parallel to the angle of insulation, just to show the path if there is laminar or if there is any turbulence at the tricuspid or the mitral valve. So as I mentioned, angle of insulation have to be parallel to the direction of the blood flow. Number four, the wall motion filter. What is the wall motion filter? We have to adjust it. The wall motion filter from it is named. It filter out any low velocity unnecessarily that may cause a noise to the spectral Doppler waveform. So um, if I'm looking for, uh, for example, pulmonary veins, I have to use a low uh, wall motion filter to filtering the signal to reduce more further to display the low flow. However, if I'm looking for um, out of flow tract, if I'm looking for uh, BSDs, for example, septal defect, I have to use a high wall motion filter so the color signal from the low velocity, it will be filtered. So I don't have any uh, noises to the uh, uh, spectral Doppler. You can see this case here. Um, in this case, I use um, uh, the scale. I decrease the scale to 24. However, the wall, for, uh, the wall uh, uh, filter is a little bit high. So hardly you can see the pulmonary vein. So once you decrease the wall uh, filter here, you can see nicely the pulmonary vein, although the fetus is tachycardia, however, you can able to assist by color the flow of the pulmonary vein nicely. Number five, the color gain. The color gain is uh, controlling the degree of amplification of the received Doppler signal. It shows you the amount of the color exhibited and you have to avoid any color overlap. Uh, this is just the case you can see how it's very low color gain and you can see just overlapping. You cannot be able to see uh, or any interpret any uh, anomalies here. Uh, just uh, using appropriate color gain, you can see appropriate filling in the color box itself. And uh, in color gain, usually with the velocity scale, you have to be optimized together. And usually I decrease the color gain slowly and slowly increase it until I have adequate filling of the color box. Uh, so these important things here, sorry, uh, the five things that we have to use it to optimize um, uh, uh, the color doppler. Uh, color box, velocity scale, uh, using an angle fascination, a wall motion filter, and using a color gain plus a velocity scale. Now we'll talk about Bauer and high definition Doppler. Uh, and what is the difference between the high Bauer Doppler and the color Doppler and the high definition Doppler? As we know that color Doppler is angle dependent, as I mentioned that it should be uh, always, uh, the blood is parallel to the angle of fascination. However, a high definition Doppler and the power Doppler are angle independent. Uh, they are both velocity, they show us the velocity and uh, they can display any turbulence. However, in power Doppler, they did not show any velocity information, no display, they did not show any turbulence. The most important thing that a color Doppler show me the direction of the blood, even the high definition Doppler. However, a power Doppler doesn't give me any information about any direction of the blood. I'll show me only flow. And the color Doppler is not sensitive to the flow flow. However, high definition Doppler, it is very sensitive to the low flow, again, the power Doppler. So we can use those for example, especially for pulmonary vein and arch anomaly. It's really helpful to determine um, any flow, uh, in, for example, in pulmonary vein. You can see this patient. Um, 
you can see here in the 2D, uh, this, is, uh, this is the spine here, and this is the left atrium. This is one pulmonary vein. You can see very nice, you can see by 2D. However, interatrial communication, the, the foramen oval is uh, protruded to the left atrium. Initially, I was just to be sure that all the pulmonary vein going to the left atrium, not uh, with this protruding, I'm not, I'm not um, missing any anomalous pulmonary vein. So using the high definition Doppler, just showing nicely the pulmonary vein going to the left atrium. Again, this is a case just came to me last week. Uh, four chamber view, very nicely here. Uh, both ventricle equal side, interventricular septum looks fine. When I put the color doublex, looks a laminar flow. However, I have a suspicion that there is some flow which is abnormal, which is not clear actually by color doublex. Just you putting high definition doublex on, you can see very nicely the VST shown very nicely uh, in this image. You can see here, as you can see, very nice the VST. So we can use it in combination with the color of, to rule out these uh, if you are not able to see it by color Doppler. Bauer Doppler, again, as I mentioned, uh, I can see it in those, especially for arch anomaly, uh, if you just want to see the flow. This patient um, have arch hypoplasia, and um, when in the two champ and um, uh, two visual view, uh, you can see very clearly that there is hypoplastic arch, however, in the sagittal view, uh, uh, there will be overlapping with the ductal arch. So when you put the power doubler, it's very clear showing that the aortic arch is very hypoplastic and the one here is the, the, uh, the ductus um, arteriosus. So uh, using the power doubler is again showing the flow. However, as you can see, it did not give you any information about the direction or any velocity. Then we'll talk about pulse wave Doppler. Uh, pulse wave Doppler is, uh, is very important to provide a diagnostic and prognostic information for fetal condition. And the most important thing in pulse wave Doppler, it will guide you for the management plan and it will help and give you information about either to deliver this fetus or not. So pulse wave Doppler, um, I will not go about the fetal circulation. Dr. Halima, she talked very nicely about it. Just a few points that usually in fetal, because of all these important shunt, right atrial pressure are equal to the left atrial pressure because of presence of the foramen oval, right ventricle equal to the LV pressure due to patent ductus arteriosus, and usually the left ventricle ejecting the blood to the upper body and cerebral circulation, the RV eject to the uh, PA through the ductus arteriosus and the lower body. And usually each ventricle has a stroke volume determined by the preload and the afterload and the contractility of that ventricle. So any increase in the afterload of one ventricle, the output of the other ventricle uh, will be increased as a compensatory manner. That's why would be a fetus with a single ventricle, usually they will not uh, have a heart failure or hydrops because actually uh, uh, the other ventricle has a compensatory and the, the output uh, of that uh, good ventricle will overcome uh, the hypoplastic one. So with advanced gestation, uh, there, be, there is uh, improvement in several things, especially which is the most important thing I'll talk about it, which is the ventricle compliance, and this is, will be affected uh, through, uh, uh, show it through uh, pulse wave Doppler. So you, usually we have arterial doubler and we have a venous doubler. Each one can provide us uh, uh, with important points, especially the arterial doubler. It's a valuable tool for assessment of peripheral vascular resistance and placenter circulation. And venous doubler allow to assess, uh, assess for the preload, cent, uh, preload, central venous pressure and cardiac function. And this tool, as I mentioned, is very important to define a pathology and define if there is any compensatory or any decompensatory it changes and allow the clinician to have a plan to deliver the fetus or not. Important tip, it is very important to when you put the cursor, you have to be parallel uh, to the uh, uh, either to the outer flow or the form of the or the AV valve. So all this keep the insulating act angle at less than 30 degrees from the direction of the blood flow. And uh, slightly keep the sample volume slightly distal to the targeted valve or within the vessel itself. So let's start by the pulse wave doubler of the mitral and the tricuspid valve. As I mentioned, we have to put the cursor of sample volume at exactly just below the valve itself and parallel 
to the blood flow. And usually the pulse wave of the mitral tricuspid valve are usually, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, usually uh, is a biphasic or M shape. This is what we call uh, the E and this is the A. This is, this is both mitral and tricuspid, they have equal uh, M shape uh, uh, looking uh, for the pulse wave. The very important thing, which we call it the E and the A wave. This is the short one, which is the E, and this is the A. The E is uh, wave velocity is showing the early ventricular filling of the diastole related to the process of myocardial relaxation. And the A itself, it is a a velocity is showing the atrial contraction during the ventricle filling. That means in fetal life, we depend mainly on atrial contraction for filling of both ventricles. Also, it's very important to have to look for the EA ratio. Um, since the A is more than the E, that means it should the A ratio in fetal life should be below one. As the pregnancy progress, and as I mentioned, the ventricle compliance improve and relaxation of the myocardium is improved. So uh, you will see the E wave velocity is start to increase progressively and the EA ratio, uh, both AV valve throughout the gestation will be elevated and the ratio um, will be improved. As you can see here, this is the difference between the fetal life and the postnatal life. The fetal life, you can see the E wave is uh, smaller than the A wave while in the postnatal life, the E is, uh, is more higher than the A wave. And, uh, uh, and this is an important uh, uh, thing that we have to note, especially in cardiology. So this is what we mentioned, the uh, normal. So how we, the abnormal inflow pattern, works. whenever have any fetal anomalies, either uh, due to severe cardiac dysfunction, severe autoflow stenosis, uh, twin twin transfusion, all this, you have usually they have abnormal inflow pattern. In a state of biphasic, they will be monophasic AV valve flow uh, pattern with complete absence of the normal biphasic pattern. And the EA morphology marker of the diastolic uh, dysfunction in the presence of other marker, uh, this is very important point that we have to look about. In monophasic AV valve, uh, this one, we should not uh, mistake uh, for those uh, in fetal arrhythmia, especially with those fetal tachycardia, they usually, they have a monophasic uh, inflow pattern, not because of cardiac dysfunction or uh, any anomaly, but because of the fetal tachycardia itself, there will be uh, the time between both components of the waveform is very short, so they look like uh, monophasic uh, pattern. Outflow track, pulse wave doubler of the outflow track. Normally, the doubler of the outflow, it is a uniphasic uni and pulmonary outflow track uh, around uh, between 50 to 80 and the aortic between 55 to 200 centimeter per second. And it indicates reflective ventricular contractility, arterial, arterial pressure, and afterload. And um, Usually hardly, if you have a stenosis, severe stenosis, usually you have to, uh, usually the outflow tract it will be more than 100, 150. Also it's important to assess the fetal heart rate, uh, usually from the beginning of the cycle to the beginning of the other cycle to assess the fetal heart rate. Important point to when using the pulse doubler is what we call the isovolumic relaxation uh, phase. Uh, this is the phase which is occur between the closure of the aortic and opening of the mitral valve, what we call the IVRT. Normally, it should be less than 50 meters second. It's very important for those patients with cardiomyopathy, uh, cardiac dysfunction. Usually, the IVRT is, will become more prolonged because they have relaxation abnormalities. Another important uh, thing in Balsobler, we use it, which is what we call the myocardial performance index, a tie index. It is very important that it gives us a global assessment of the systolic and diastolic function, where we measure uh, the isovolumic contraction time to the isovolumic relaxation time over the ejection time. This is the mitral inflow, and this is the left outflow track. To just you put the cursor between the mitral and the left outflow track and just you will able to see the inflow pattern and the outflow track. And uh, just uh, you will divide um, the isovolumic contraction plus the isovolumic relaxation over the ejection time to give you the tie index or myocardial performance index. Normal between 0.3 
uh, nine, any uh, longer uh, MBI, that means we have a more worse and their storage dysfunction. Clinical implication is very reliable and early marker for cardiac dysfunction. And especially for those with IGR, uh, MBA is one of the earliest parameter effect. Uh, it will be remain uh, affected throughout the different stage of IUGR deterioration. Uh, pulse wave of ductus arteriosus. Ductus arteriosus, um, as uh, Dr. Harima, she talked about it nicely, it is a shunt bypass the high resistant pulmonary vascular lid because of the lung is collapsed uh, in triterine. So most of the blood go through the ductus arteriosus and only 10% go to the uh, pulmonary uh, to the uh, pulmonary vasculation. So normal systolic velocity should be less than 160 and the diastolic should be less than 140. And we have uh, abnormal ductus arteriosus. This is just uh, whenever we have a high systolic flow. This is just to show a criteria, especially for those with ductal constriction, where you have a right and left ventricle enlargement, tricuspid valve regurgitation. However, the most important thing is you have a peak systolic velocity more than uh, 1.4 meter second, and the diastolic is more than 0.35 uh, meter per second. Um, just to show you a case, uh, this is uh, this is the spine here posterior, and um, this is the pulmonary artery, and this is the ductus arteriosus here, and this is the transverse aortic arch, the superior vena cava. And you can see this is a tiny flow here. You can see this is a severe ductal constriction here. And so the mother, uh, she's at late gestation, alhamdulillah, at 33 week gestation. So we deliver her immediately. And you can see immediately we did for her postnatal echo. You can see a very tiny ductus artery, almost closing ductus arteriosus. So this is just to show an example of severe ductus arteriosus constriction. Dina Stobler, um, as I mentioned, Dina Stobler is an important uh, to, uh, to just to document the compensatory and the decompensatory chain. And it is very important to give you the plan of that uh, uh, for any fetal uh, intervention or delivery. Pulmonary venous Stobler, uh, we have the pulmonary venous Stobler represent um, mainly the left atrial pressure throughout the cardiac cycle. It consists of a systolic flow, diastolic flow, and a very tiny reversal flow. You can see here, this is the pulmonary veins by color Doppler. You have to put a low color Doppler scale with a low wall filter, just to show the filling in the pulmonary vein. And when you put the pulse wave Doppler over these pulmonary, which give you this, this is systole and diastole and small airway reversal. So when, when we have an abnormal pulmonary venous Doppler, initially you will have what you will have increased in the left atrial pressure due to several causes. So there will be initially, there will be increase in the airway reversal. Those patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, when you have restricted interatrial communication, you usually have a very severe uh, reversal in the airway reversal and reduction in the D-wave velocity. Um, in more severe situation, you will have uh, more, uh, it will be a biphasic uh, flow and there will be a significant reversal uh, increase in the airway reversal. It will be biphasic flow representing only the airway reversal and the systolic uh, wave, uh, systolic anti-grade flow. This is, this is in severe uh, situation. Inferior vena cava, uh, hepatic vein uh, pulse wave Doppler again, um, the same, it consists of systole flow and diastole flow and very tiny uh, flow uh, reversal, as you can see here. And any abnormality uh, in the inferior or hepatic venous Doppler, again, it will start by increasing in the airway reversal. When you start to increase in the airway reversal, that means indicating that there is increase in the central venous pressure, or in the more severe, it will be biphasic like this. This is a more severe where you have severe cardiac dysfunction due to an abnormal Ahyanan IVC flow pattern with reduction in the D-wave component and increase in the A-wave reversal. Patient with, uh, as you can see, this is with a tricuspid atresia. This is the spine here, and this is hypoplastic right ventricle with tricuspid atresia. This is the left ventricle. You can see this is the mitral valve. You can see slightly dilated left atrium, uh, sorry, uh, right atrium with bowing of the interatrial communication to the left, indicating uh, uh, a very high uh, uh, venous uh, flow uh, uh, Doppler. And you can see when we put the Doppler, there is increase in the airway reversal. 
However, this is considered sometimes is the normal for those cases with tricuspid atresia. Ductus venosus is very important uh, shunt where it's a small vessel, as all we know, is the direct, the highly oxygenated blood uh, from the, through the foramen oval, from the right atrium directly to the left atrium. And this is a very important flow. It, 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 is, it is anti-grade flow of triphasic flow throughout the cardiac cycle, highest velocity uh, during the ventricular systole, uh, and then diastole, and the A wave a contraction. It continue continuous flow, a very low velocity. However, it will be continuous. It will not uh, be, it will not reach the baseline. This is the most important thing that the, um, the Doppler of the A contraction, it does not reach the baseline. So this is the normal flow in ductus venosus. Once you have decrease in the atrial systole, once it start to reach to the baseline, this is indicating, and you can see this is a reverse A wave. This is an abnormal ductus venous uh, Doppler. And again, this is, can be seen in severe cardiac dysfunction where you have a reversal in the A wave, a reduction in the B wave velocity. Umbilical uh, venous uh, Doppler, umbilical artery Doppler. Um, um, umbilical artery is connected to a low resistant placenta. So again, the flow is normally continuous in systole and the diastole. As you can see, this is the umbilical artery is continuous flow. Diminish in the diastolic flow, umbilical artery, uh, like in case of the IUGR cases or placental uh, insufficiency. Usually diastolic flow, this the diastolic flow um, it will be initially start initially reaching to the baseline until in severe situation, it will have a reversal flow. This is indicate a very high risk uh, for uh, you to uh, demise. The most important thing, which is umbilical vein. Umbilical vein, it should be continuous Doppler throughout the cardiac cycle. Um, this is normally to have to be a continuous heat. And if the fetal central venous pressure raise, so they have what we call a pulsating or notch in the, uh, in the umbilical uh, venous doubler. And this is, that mean indicate a very severe uh, fetal uh, compromise. So a very important that we, uh, whenever we have any abnormality in the pulse wave doubler, we have to do what we call the cardiovascular profile score. It grade uh, the severity of fetal heart failure by five echocardiographic uh, parameters, uh, fusion, Doppler, heart size, function, and arterial Doppler. Usually those with severe, they have a less than five point and the one score of 10 indicating uh, no heart failure. This is, you can see here, this is um, the cardiovascular profile score where starting by high drops, uh, venous Doppler's, uh, heart size, heart function, arterial Doppler, all of them, these, they have a normal Doppler. For example, no high drops, a normal umbilical venous Doppler, ductus venous is normal, continuous flow, no cardiomegaly, uh, no valve regurgitations, uh, umbilical artery is uh, normal. Once to start to have a reversal flow in the ductus venosus and absent in the in diastolic uh, velocity, uh, with still the umbilical vein is still continuous. However, the more severe when you have umbilical vein uh, pulsation and almost uh, reversed in the diastolic flow in the umbilical artery, that may indicate that the fetal heart is very severe uh, fetal compromise. Lastly, we'll go for a pulse wave Doppler, uh, how to assist in case of uh, cardiac rhythm. I think probably Dr. Halima, she will have um, another lecture about uh, heart rhythm assessment. However, just um, we'll talk about uh, how to assist the fetal heart rate when we have any arrhythmia. So uh, whenever usually, um, uh, to initially we have to assist the AV conduction in any normal uh, fetal echo, we have to be sure that uh, uh, we have atri normal one-to-one -one conduction. That means one atria to one ventricle conduction. And we have to have a fetal heart rate of between 110 to 180. So if there is any arrhythmia, we have to do an extra method to be sure what is the cause of this arrhythmia, which is we call the mitral aortic doubler and severe venicavia aortic doubler, and finally the immune. As you can see, this is a fetal heart. Uh, just uh, last, I think, month uh, Ramadan came to us with a severe uh, high drops 
and uh, abnormal heart rhythm. Uh, so initially we have to do what we call the mitral inflow to aortic outflow Doppler, where we can put the cursor, as you can see, between the mitral and the aortic flow in the fourth chamber flow, and show me the mitral, this is the inflow, and this is the aortic. So mitral, aortic, mitral, aortic, that means one-to-one -one conduction. This is a normal, regular fetal heart rate. Just we have to assess the fetal heart rate again to be sure that it is normal. Um, we also, we have to assess what we call the AV interval, which is correspond to the PR interval. It is a starting from the onset of the A wave to the onset of the aortic ejection, and we calculate it. We call it what we call the AV time interval, or the, uh, especially for those with uh, autoimmune disorder or those suspicion of first degree or second degree heart attack. Uh, this is a lady who had a previous baby with a heart block and she had a follow-up. She came to us just like uh, last week to assess how is the AV interval. As you can see from the uh, starting the E to the beginning of the aortic ejection and measuring the time, it is uh, 100, uh, which is uh, normal. Uh, anything more than 130 um, should be abnormal. Less than this, this is considered normal. The other way we use the SVC aortic doubler where you put the cursor, um, this is the aortic, and this is this is in sagittal view. This is the spine here. As you can see, this is almost like a bicable. This is the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava down, and this is the left outflow track. You just put the cursor here just to show you uh, the inflow, which is the superior, the retrograde flow, and this is the aortic flow, similar to the mitral and the aortic. And usually from the beginning of the uh, severe vena cava, uh, reversal flow, and the beginning of the aortic. This is again measuring the AV time interval. It can give you also a hint about if there's, uh, for example, two to one heart to block or blocked AVC, uh, blocked PACs. This is all we can more uh, talk in detail when we have uh, arrhythmia uh, literature. Just, uh, just about the M mode, which is, I think, important to optimize the M mode when we do it in those cases. Uh, where we put the cursor between the atria and the ventricle. And before we put the cursor, we put exactly, we see by 2D, which is the area where the atria is moving more. So we put the cursor over it. You can see this is the atria here. You can see this is the atria. This is the hump of the atria. atria. And the ventricle up, I can see this is the ventricle. So it's almost regular atria, ventricle, atria, ventricle, atria. But this patient, she had a premature atrial contraction where a normal atrial, where uh, just a small a premature atrial contraction start immediately after the normal atrial uh, contraction. This is what we call a premature atrial contraction. Um, thank you very much. Uh, just a um, uh, few things. I hope you uh, uh, give you more information about uh, Doppler's. I know we have more information in the box, however, the time little bit cannot uh, give uh, everything. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. Thanks, Dr. Marina. Very well uh, informative uh, presentation. So for the audience, uh, just I want to tell you, uh, inshallah, this uh, webinar will be recorded and you can uh, visualize it uh, later in the uh, channel of the uh, uh, OSA. And now the floor is open for the questions. So uh, I can see here there are two questions. Uh, since uh, Dr. Mena just finished, I think this question can be directed to you. Uh, Dr. Asma is uh, asking, there are a couple of patients who are uh, pregnant and they are on uh, aspirin. Which one will need fetal echo? I think this question is more related when we talk about the ductal uh, constriction. Do you want to answer this question, Dr. Mena? So if you know uh, a lady who's on aspirin, when would you like uh, to scan the fetus uh, in this patient? Uh, for example, if the uh, fetal maternal uh, uh, see what on in echo? Otherwise, our <laughs> clinic will be full for those ladies who are on uh, aspirin. Yeah, uh, yeah, there is a lot of ladies due to placental insufficiency, but probably my colleague in uh, maternal fetal medicine, they know more but better than this. So they have a lot of ladies using aspirin. However, in those with ductal constriction, uh, usually we, uh, they use more uh, with non-steroidal like um, Voltaren mainly, 
especially in late gestation, uh, usually affect the ductal uh, cell con uh, constriction itself. So we don't use in every lady that using aspirin that usually do fetal echo, only if you have a suspicion uh, that, for example, if there is cardiomegaly and she's having tricuspid regard or increased flow in the uh, systolic or diastolic flow of the ductal uh, Doppler, uh, or she using a high uh, dose of uh, Voltaren, for example, dental problems in the late gestation, actually, because this is the period where uh, they have high sensitivity for uh, ductal constriction if these medications being used. Um, Halima, uh, if you don't mind, um, I just want to clarify this uh, point because uh, nowadays we have you no know, high risk patients. Um, when they do a risk assessment for the eclampsia and IOGR, they start them in low dose aspirin. So I think we should uh, discriminate between these two points. Uh, otherwise, our clinic will be full of referrals because these patients are started. On. So low dose aspirin, whether it is 75 or even 150, is safe during pregnancy, it doesn't affect what uh, Dr. Suad and uh, Dr. Men. Uh, uh, mentioning is about group, and this is why aspirin is actually stopped after 34 weeks because of this risk. So those patients who are on low dose aspirin it doesn't affect the heart, and they don't prepare patients who already started on aspirin for fetal echo. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Moza, for the elaboration. So I hope Asma, the answer is clear for you. When there is only right, when, first of all, as Moza said, high dose of aspirin right ventricular hypertrophy, tricuspid regurgitation, and the ductus, there is high velocity. Then you need to refer the patient. Otherwise, uh, no need. The second question, I think it's uh, to Suad. Uh, it's about the uh, uh, scanning. For, uh, she's mentioning about the... Uh, um, yeah. Uh, does the preconceptual value of HbA1c change the incidence or type of uh, heart anomaly? Uh, actually, uh, during the embryology, I mean, uh, during the- Sarah, uh, are you? Yes, I am with you. Still there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me, Halima? Yeah, we can hear you, Dr. Suad. You can go ahead. Yes. Yes. Actually, uh, pre-conceptual or uh, yes. pre- yes. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, the, the uh, level of uh, hemoglobin A1C is very important, you know, because it will carry on because uh, embryogenesis occur very early uh, of, of, fetal, uh, of the fetal heart. So uh, the changes will occur very early. So I think the incidence will be just as high as, you know, early pregnancy. So we have to make sure of the uh, hemoglobin A1C even before the pregnancy. I think this will determine. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I don't know what what the practice. I mean, you, you're doing the ob there, but here in Bahrain, we see lots of patients with changes and uh, you know, or congenital heart disease because they miss the the early stage of uh, gestational diabetes. They were not following, and they they present to us in the second uh, trimester or third trimester with very high blood sugar. So I think the the uh, the control or of the hemoglobin A1C earlier is is very important. Uh, and it will not, I mean, the incidence will be almost the same, you know, if it's not controlled, whether pre-pregnancy or during the uh, the first trimester. I hope I answered your question, uh, doctor. Uh, thanks, Saad, again for the elaboration. Uh, just I want to emphasize uh, one point, uh, <laughs> because, because so many of our patients are really diabetic. Some of them are pre-gestational and the other are uh, gestational. And again, the same thing, the clinic will be uh, filled only with diabetic uh, patients. I agree that the glycemic control is very, very uh, important. Uh, yet, uh, and some ladies, even with gestation, they will have ventricular hypertrophy. But uh, personally, I don't see uh, all uh, the ladies with, um, even like if it's HbA1c more than six, but there is no really uh, major cardiac anomaly. We have a very expert, uh, uh, colleagues in the fetal maternal who uh, will do their uh, scanning. If they suspect really there is a congenital uh, heart disease, then uh, they will refer to me. Otherwise, if there is only just a very subtle uh, hypertrophy, then I will not review if they are gestational. Uh, same thing for uh, pre-gestational. 
if there is a structural heart disease, uh, I'm more than happy to uh, review them. But like just only sc uh, scanning or screening just because of uh, uncontrolled uh, uh, diabetes, then uh, this will be too much uh, load, especially uh, if uh, you don't have so many, uh, so someone to help you. Uh, I agree 100% with you, Dr. Halima, uh, regarding what you have already said about the gestational diabetes. But actually, the fetal maternal, even here in Bahrain, they are doing a great screening. Uh, similarly, they will only refer when there is like, you know, really a, a high suspicious of uh, congenital heart disease, like uh, in form of, of, of really abnormal heart, they would, they would refer for the pediatric cardiologist. But as you mentioned, also, it's, it's mainly the, the brain pathology, they will, they will say like when, when to refer, if they have high suspicious, they will just refer to us. Uh, thanks. I, uh, third question, maybe it's a general question. Or Dr. Uh, Dr. Mena, are you around? Uh, Dr. Mena. Okay. So third question from Dr. Maisa: Are we are we uh, referring all SLE patients for uh, fetal echo, and on which uh, gestation? <laughs> Mashallah, the questions. Okay. <laughs> So uh, for the auto -anti antibodies, we know that uh, uh, the uh, from 18, like the 22 weeks, is the maximum period of uh, transferring the antibodies. Uh, again, same thing. If the fetal maternal is uh, expert in scanning, like uh, ruling out the structural vulvar heart disease, the heart rhythm, the heart rate, uh, then maybe no need. But if the lady uh, has a previous history of uh, uh, of a baby with complete heart block, the risk of recurrence might reach up to uh, 10 times. Then this lady worth uh, the uh, referral for uh, uh, fetal echo. Or in that current scanning, she noted anything abnormal. But uh, otherwise, like if she's an SLE and uh, there is no issue, then maybe uh, will I be selective? I will not accept. Or if she is beyond uh, 24 weeks, uh, or more than that, and there is no abnormality identified. I hope it's clear. So the, uh, the uh, if there is previous baby with complete heart block, if in the current uh, pregnancy, there is any problem with a structural valvular or uh, heart uh, rhythm, uh, I, I will scan. But just like referring all SLE, if the current... Uh, uh, pregnancy is uh, normal. Um, usually, I I don't do it unless, uh, for example, the uh, fetal maternal is worried. I hope it is clear. Uh, then, uh, same doctor who asked about uh, HbA1c. So I back to you. Is there a cutoff uh, value for HbA1c? Uh, I'm not Bad or uh, more. Yeah. Maybe Dr. Moza will elaborate better. Uh, I don't know, so I'd, usually, yeah. So, Moza, what do you think? Yeah, uh, usually what we, what we do is the patient for it. No, we are not going by the by the only uh, uh, what is like related hemoglobin, but also we are looking to the whole clinical picture of the patient. I mean, if the patient, for example, she had already anomaly scan and the heart looks grossly normal. Um, and then she will come up with that patient because she has pre-gestational diabetes. She will have again another growth scan at 28 weeks and 32 weeks. And during these scans, if the heart, there is no hypertrophy and there is no unconfirmed, there is no congenital anomaly. So we, we, we no need to refer her to the, uh, I mean, uh, fetal echo. Yes, um, I agree that um, if the patient, for example, she has pre-gestation and her uh, blood sugar profile is up and down, but the heart is not affected, no need for return her to the fetal echo unless we do screening and we find that there is, for example, hypertrophy or there is some query um, suspecting some uh, complex cardiac defect, then yes, we refer her to you. Uh, thank you, Moza. Then uh, there is another question uh, from Dr. Sunayana. Uh, please, can you again tell how to decide left and right side of the heart in cross-section in relation to spine? Uh, 
uh, maybe it will be clear for you when you see the uh, recorded uh, lecture, Dr. Sanayana. Uh, but uh, uh, now I have to go back to the uh, presentation. So uh, uh, that uh, method called the uh, Cordis method, uh, and it's mentioned very clear in an article. Uh, you can review it in that article and in the uh, presentation. Uh, our technique in scanning, uh, in determining the right and left is different from your uh, technique. So I found some of my colleagues still, even if they uh, come and join, and some of the sonographer, even if they come and join the uh, uh, fetal echo, they prefer to use your technique instead of our technique. They feel it is confusing. Some of them started to learn the uh, Cordis method. At the end, uh, uh, it's your decision, as long as you don't get uh, confused between the two uh, approaches. Uh, no more questions, if there are um, any. I just, um, Halim, I have uh, just a question so that we can clarify it. And that's, I think, mentioned by the floor uh, so about isolated ecogenic focal, you know? Yeah. We are uh, getting a referral of isolated ecogenic focal, which is, if it is isolated, uh, it's not an indication to refer the patient. The same now, recently, we are getting a lot of referrals because of isolated uh, aberrant right subclavian artery. Thank you. So uh, can, can the speakers elaborate on this, uh, please? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Moza. So back about the ecogenic foci or foci, I totally agree with you. No, not an indication for fetal echo, also not an indication for postnatal echo. Still, even mm -hmm. <laughs> postnatal, we get referral. If you don't do them uh, in the fetal, they will refer to us in postnatal. So they are not an indication either for fetal echo or postnatal echo. The second uh, frequent uh, referral we get, mashallah, we have... Uh, uh, very well and very good, uh, uh, not only the fetal maternal, but also the, the physicians in the uh, health center when they scan. So sometimes if a patient like with left aortic arch and apparent subclavian artery, they will refer to us. Uh, these cases, no need to refer them. This is like an abnormal variant. As long as there is no uh, vascular ring, so no need to refer a patient uh, who has a fetus with left aortic arch and aberrant uh, left subclavian artery. I hope it's clear. But if you have a patient with right aortic arch and aberrant left subclavian artery where you suspect might be a vascular ring, then that's another thing. But left aortic arch and left ductal arch and aberrant right subclavian, please don't uh, refer them. And this is also one of the things which will increase the maternal anxiety, as when Suad mentioned clearly in her uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I agree I with you. There are any more questions? Uh, I think they are the same ones. No more questions. So, uh, if no more questions, maybe we'll. Uh, We'll end it then. What do you think? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Merna and Dr. Saad, for accepting the invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Moza. And I would like to thank all the audience. I hope you all get the benefit and we shared our experience with you. And we are motivated also for the uh, coming session, inshallah, to talk more and more about the fetal uh, Echo under the umbrella of uh, Oman Society of Ultrasound and OB Gynecology. And as we promised, this lecture for those who missed it or for those who do, uh, find some of the um, topic uh, they cannot uh, catch, then uh, you can uh, see the uh, recorded uh, presentations. Thank you so much again and have a good night. Thank you, very much. Thank, you thank you. Thank, thank you, you for the great uh, speech uh, from all. Uh, the speakers, it was, it was uh, excellent talks uh, from all of you. And we really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you Zaki, uh, behind the scenes. <laughs> She's coordinating everything. Thank you so much, Zakia. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.